Hey guys and welcome to another video in my University Physics Revision series. In this video we're going to be having a look at the Carnot cycle. Um, so quite an important thing in thermodynamics, the Carnot cycle. Um, so I'm going to talk you through it nice and slowly, tell you exactly what it is, uh, and also how it ties in with the second law of thermodynamics and also how you can kind of apply it to things like um, refrigerators, uh, which also use the Carnot cycle. Uh, and things like heat pumps as well. Um, and it's actually a pretty useful thing in a lot of engineering um, circles. So, you know, it actually does cover quite a fundamental thing uh, really about thermodynamics. Um, so yeah, let's, let's just take it from the top. So what is an engine, first of all? Let's ask ourselves, what is the point of an engine? Um, obviously the point of an engine is to convert one form of energy do like a load of you know maybe some crazy shit you know some mad explosions or mad fire or something and then convert it into some sort of useful work you know it's it's the point is to convert uh, heat energy so we're converting heat energy uh, doing some sort of reaction or you know something going on some some like furnace thing you know if you imagine like your typical um, steam engine, uh, that's converting, you know, heat from the steam uh, and it's producing useful mechanical work out of it. And we can write that mathematically as the work extracted, you use this little subscript here uh, to indicate extracted, is equal to the heat uh, that you put in. So the more heat you put in to an engine, then the work extracted is then the more work you get extracted. If something, say like a gas, is extracting work, then what does that really mean? Well, it means that the, the gas is doing work on its surroundings. Work is not being done by the gas. So let's say we've got our gas right here. This gas is doing work. In other words, it's expanding. This gas is expanding, and that could maybe be like, you know, moving some sort of piston down as it expands, you know, the piston's, you know, moving down, and that could be, you know, connected to some sort of a wheel or something, and that could, you know, drive drive the wheel around. That's how a steam locomotive works. Um, but the point is that the gas is expanding as it's doing work, and so we actually say that Q is equal to minus the work because remember our sign convention, if work was being absorbed by the gas, then W would be positive. But um, if work, if the gas is doing work, then it's minus W. So that's basically a principle of uh, an engine. But the thing is, is that heat can only be transferred between two different sources. So what you really have is you have source one up here, and source 2 right here and these are of different temperatures so this is going to be maybe at some hot temperature and this one here this could be anything you know this this one right here could be like you know sort of the, the you know the furnace or something where the reaction is taking place um, and the heat is being transferred to this colder surrounding that here um, and so therefore uh, you know heat can only really flow because of this temperature differential you have here um, and in the process of heat flowing then you can get some sort of a work some work out but and here's the key thing you can never convert 100% of this heat here uh, so let's call this Q sub H so this is the heat being drawn out from the, the from the hot source you can never convert 100% of this heat right here into work right here and that is actually another way of phrasing the second law of thermodynamics is that you always have some sort of wasted heat right here so what's happening here um, you're you're putting in heat into the system uh, the, some of the heat is being converted into work but the rest of the heat is converted. There's still some always leftover cold heat. And it's for this reason alone that you can never have, you can never have a 100% efficient engine. So there will always be, there will always be some wasted heat, some dissipated heat. Not all of the heat that you put in 
will 100% be converted usefully into mechanical work. Um, and so you can you can write this mathematically. You can say that the actual work that you do get is equal to the difference between the hot source and the cold source. So you put heat in, uh, some of it gets converted into work, but there is also some leftover. Um, so how can we quantify efficiency? Um, well, efficiency, let's give it the symbol eta. Efficiency is basically what you get out divided by what you put in. So what, what do we want out of this system? Well, we obviously want the work um, being done. So that's so the useful bit goes on the numerator. And so uh, that becomes W uh, is on the numerator. Uh, what do we put in? Well, we're putting in this right here. This is going into the system. It often really helps to draw out this diagram. This this diagram makes makes sort of the process of uh, heat converting into work a lot easier to understand. So always draw out one of these diagrams. They are of great benefit. But um, yeah, so you're putting in hot, uh, putting in this heat, say that the efficiency is equal to the work divided by the heat that you put in. So it's what you want to, to come out divided by what goes in. And you can, um, since we know that work is QH minus QC, you can simply substitute this into here and simply get the efficiency is QH minus QC. So the difference in heat divided by QH. And you can tidy that up and say that it's 1 minus QC over QH. So that is the efficiency of any engine. It's not the Carnot efficiency, but this is just the efficiency of any engine uh, that you care to have. So what? let's move on to what the Carnot cycle is. And for that, for that, we're going to draw a pressure volume chart. We've drawn a few of these before. It's a diagram of the pressure on the y-axis and the volume on the x-axis. And here is our zero point. And let's say we have some sort of a gas which has a pressure up here. So, you know, maybe a fairly high pressure and a fairly low uh, volume. Now the Carnot cycle, uh, the reason it's called a cycle is because it's kind of like a cycle within this graph right here. Um, and for the moment we're going to consider a clockwise Carnot cycle. Uh, we're going to run the cycle clockwise. Uh, we'll get into what the physical meaning of running it anti-clockwise is later in the video. But we're going to run the Carnot cycle clockwise. So we've got this gas here at, um, at this point here. So it's got a pressure, a certain pressure, a certain volume and a certain temperature. And what we're going to do is we're going to increase the volume of the gas. However, we are going to increase the volume of the gas isothermally. Again, that's the key thing. It's isothermal. And to make sure it's isothermal or to make note that it's isothermal, we're going to call this uh, the hot temperature, TH. Um, and so therefore, this part of this process right here of going from this point to this point is an isothermal expansion of the gas. Um, so which means it's happening at the same temperature. Physically, that means that it's happening um, with a heat bath. You have the gas surrounded by some sort of a bath of heat, which is a t constant temperature. So that's how you do it. Um, so that's the first stage of the process. Uh, let's put a little one there just to um, just to remind ourselves which stage of the process it is. And what we're going to now do is we're now going to increase it more. However, oh, whoops, we're going to do it like this. And you might wonder, what's this? Um, this is not isothermal. It looks like it's decreasing in temperature. Because remember, isotherms are on a PV diagram are like that, like that, like that. And the ones lower down are obviously of decreasing temperature. Um, and so, well, it's actually an adiabatic change. It's an adiabatic expansion from uh, this point here to this point here. Uh, what, what does adiabatic mean again? Well, adiabatic means that no heat in or no heat out. Careful, it's not the same as isothermal. When I first started doing thermodynamics, 
I was just like, what's the difference between no heat and constant temperature? But um, yeah, it's a little bit weird, but I've, I've, I've gone through why um, the temperature can still change even though there's no heat in or no heat out um, in previous videos. So yeah, this is an adiabatic expansion. And of course the temperature's changing as well um, from temperature hot uh, it's actually cooling down as it expands. Let's call this bottom uh, temperature, this new temperature here, Tc. So this is the colder temperature. So what are we now going to do? Well, we're actually going to go back along this way right here. I'm going to go back along this way right here. So what's happening here? Well, it's a, it's a contraction. The gas is getting smaller. Um, and you're having to put work in this time. Um, you're doing work on the gas to make it smaller, and so therefore uh, work is going in. So as you're compressing the gas, uh, you're therefore the heat is being lost to its surroundings. Um, so due to the first law of thermodynamics, so this is an isothermal uh, compression between this point and this point. And finally, we're going to join it back up with the first part of the graph. Uh, and this is going to be another adiabatic change. Um, let's call this three. Uh, this is going to be another adiabatic change from this point here to this point here. It's an adiabatic contraction, uh, no heat in, no, <clears throat> no heat out. And so therefore, we're going to end up exactly back where we started. And this is the Carnot cycle. Uh, you go all the way around and you go around clockwise. Uh, and so you end up back where you started. And so you can keep going around this cycle. Um, you know, this is how engines work, in fact. This is how to get the best possible efficiency of any sort of engine. You go around the Carnot cycle, so it's two isothermal changes, this one here and this one here, and two adiabatic changes, these two right here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to work out what the efficiency is I said that it was uh, the maximum possible you could get, but I'm going to now do a derivation to show what the efficiency of the Carnot cycle is. So I'm going to just put a little C right here. We're going to derive the efficiency of the Carnot cycle. Uh, and so, well, let's move on to a new line, bit of a big derivation, this one. Um, so what is efficiency? Uh, the efficiency is the work extracted which is what you want, the useful work extracted, divided by the heat that goes in. So Q of the hot source right here. So what is that? Well, the work we've said many times before is equal to minus the integral of P dV. But of course, right here, we've kind of got four processes happening. So what we're actually gonna have to do is we're going to have to sort of add these four together. Um, the way you represent this mathematic mathematically is you put a little ring right here to show it's a closed integral. You always finish at the same point as where you start. Um, and because obviously work is a process variable, you will get work out, it's path dependent. And it actually turns out that the area, the area under this curve is the amount of work, the useful work that you get out or the, the work that you get out of the Carnot cycle. So that's a key thing to remember. The area under the curve is the useful work. So let's go ahead and work out what the work is for each of these different types of processes. So let's start with the first one. Um, so let's just write this out again. So the work is, it's gonna be the sum of the work done from one to two, PDV, Remember, there's a minus in all this. <clears throat> um, plus the work done from stage two to stage three, um, <clears throat> PDV. Plus the work done from stage three to four, PDV. Plus four to one, PDV. So it's going to be a bit of a lengthy calculation, this, but you do get a very nice, neat result at the end of it. So in it is definitely one of those calculations that is kind of like a must know in thermodynamics. So let's go ahead and do that. So stage one to two, um, let's go ahead and call these one, two, three, and four, just so we know what we're talking about. 
Um, so the work, the work extracted, remember I said was minus the work. And so therefore we can actually just take off this minus sign right here. So the work extracted is actually just all this stuff added together. Um, so we can ignore this minus sign right here and then uh, we can just simply start um, <clears throat> doing some substitutions for these integrals. So let's go ahead and put in the first one. So what's 1 to 2? Well, um, 1 to 2 is an isothermal change. Uh, so we know that temperature is constant. Um, so we're going to have to use our old friend, the ideal gas law, uh, PV equals NRT. Ooh, oops. PV equals N R T right here. Um, and so what's P? Well P is going to be N R T over V. Um, and for this first term right here, because it's isothermal, we can put the N R T, all these are constants, none of these depend on volume. Um, we can put that all on the outside. And so what are we integrating over? Well, we're integrating over a volume, so let's give it some limits. Volume one, volume two. Um, I should just explain what these are. This point right here is volume is at volume one, and this point right here is at volume two. Um, I, I know I'm, I'm introducing a lot of terms right here, but don't worry, they will all um, disappear, and you can write a much more general statement at the end of it. So, um, so here we go, NRT, um, we haven't fully done the substitution of pressure, uh, so let's just put this 1 over V right here, uh, dV. So that's our first term right here, this is 1 to 2. Uh, I should just put a little reminder underneath, so this is from stage 1 to stage 2. So for this next term right here, um, we have integral of P dV, however uh, with this substitution we, should, we could get away with this 1 over V dV. Um, and simply putting T out the front. However, we can't quite do that because it's adiabatic and there could well be a temperature change. So what I'm actually going to do is, as I'm going to go and resort to the first law of thermodynamics and use the relation that work is simply the, simply the same as the change in energy uh, right here. So, um, so what is the change in energy? Well, we know that U is 3 over 2 nRT. Okay, so that is that is the change, that is the energy. And so the change in energy is therefore delta U equals 3 over 2 nR, which are both constants, delta T. Uh, and as you can see, we can simply sub in what delta T is because we've got TC and th right here. So instead of doing this PDV right here, um, for the adiabatic changes, since we know that there's no heat going in, we know that the work is exactly the same as the internal, the change in internal energy. So uh, let's go ahead and do substitute that in right there. So we're going to get, so we're going to get that it's a minus, because remember work extracted is minus, uh, 3 over 2. N R and the change in temperature is simply T C minus T H. So that's stage two to three. That's the adiabatic term. Um, and what about stage three to four? Well, that's isothermal again. So we're going to add onto that um, the integral between uh, this one here. We're going to call this one volume V three, and this one here we're going to call V four. The integral between V3 and V4 of, um, since it's isothermal again, we can do the same uh, little trick we did before, put N R T out the front. Um, I should actually just add a little subscript here, because this is of course uh, this arm right here, and that's of course TC. Um, remember, to put, remember that subscript, and this last one here was along TH. Uh, I should really have put that in a bit sooner. I do apologise, but yeah, um, that those are our temperature terms added, um, and we're integrating one over v dv yet again. And so, um, and so now we have to add our final term, stage four to one. It's an adiabatic term again, uh, and so therefore we're going to be doing minus three over two 
NR um, and we're going to be going from the TH this time uh, to TC that's our final temperature that's our initial temperature right here so there we go that's our final adiabatic term added right there so well we've got all these terms let's just write in that that's three to four and right in that's four to one uh, we do need to do a little bit of integration but as you can see right here this term right here is exactly the opposite of this term here look at them 3 over 2 nr th minus t tc minus th um, and that that minus sign is negated which means you can just effectively switch that direction of the minus signs and add a plus and then you've got the same two terms added and subtracted so before we go any further we can actually just simply uh, reduce this right here reduce this whole expression to n r t h from v1 to v2 1 over v dv plus n r t c integral from v3 to v4 1 over v dv as these terms are just gone they they are exactly the same the work that's being extracted between stages two and three is exactly the same as the work that's being done uh, from stages four to one. So there we go. That's made our life a lot easier. So now let's just do these integrals. So we're going to get nr th, and remember when we integrate one over v, we're going to get the log of v2 over v1. I presume you guys are quite happy with what I've done right there. You're going to end up getting log of v evaluated between v2 and v1. And since, um, and since obviously uh, the law of logs, log A minus log B is log A over B, you can simply just do that. I have done that step a couple of times before, uh, so I hope you guys are okay with me just sort of doing that. Um, saves a bit of time. And so uh, the last one, you can go uh, NRTC, learn of V4 divided by V3 right here. So that's our work extracted. Uh, that is the total amount of work that we're going to get out of the Carnot cycle. That's our numerator term. Um, but what about the denominator? Uh, what is What have we got to put in uh, for our efficiency? Well, the thing we're putting in is, of course, the heat. Um, and heat is going in in only two parts of the Carnot cycle. Remember, we have an isothermal change, a diabatic change, isothermal change, adiabatic change, and heat is going in um, only on these two arms right here. There's no heat at all going in uh, in the adiabatic um, processes. So what is the heat that is going in? What is the heat that's being uh, absorbed by the system? Well, QH, so yeah, that's what we want to find out. What is QH? QH is simply um, from the first law of thermodynamics, we know that uh, delta U is simply equal to Q plus W. We want the heat absorbed by the system, so we want positive Q. And we said that it's only this arm that counted. This is the heat that's going in. We're not actually interested in this arm uh, right here. This is the heat that's going out. We're not really interested in that. That doesn't really matter for our efficiency, we're interested in the heat going in. And so therefore we know that this is isothermal. This is part of, this is an isothermal change. And so since it's isothermal, we can actually say that delta U is zero. And the reason why that is, is that U equals three over two NRT. Um, and so if, and since these two are both constants, then changing the temperature if there's no change in temperature then there's no change in the mean internal energy of the of the system and so delta u is simply zero so zero equals q plus the w uh, and therefore q q h i should say is minus the work and minus the work is simply plus p integral uh plus there, I should not should not do that, plus the integral P dV, uh, which is, since it's isothermal, NRT, integral between V1 and V2, remember, this is 0.1, this is 0.2, uh, 
of 1 over v dv. And so, and remember this T is uh, the hot temperature right here. So what is this right here? What's the integral? Well, we've just done this integral. So N nRT log of V2 minus over V1, V2 over V1. So this is our denominator. This is the QH term. So let's substitute all of that into efficiency. Um, so this is the Carnot efficiency, remember? So what do we have on the top? Well, on the top, we had all this crap right here. So instead, of, I'm going to be quite lazy here, and I'm just going to copy and paste it. So we had the term. So this this term was what we had um, from this arm right here. This term is what we had from this arm right here. So work. There is a change in the work uh, in both of these terms. Remember, the adiabatic terms just simply cancelled out. Um, and so th there, this is our numerator right here. And what about the denominator? Well, uh, it's simply what we just derived, QH. It's NRTH ln of V2 divided by V1. So, um, oh, Mr. 3 there. So what can we do with this? Well, as you can see, if you pull apart this fraction, you can simply see that uh, you've got this term is exactly the same as this term, so it kind of cancels. You're going to get a 1 plus nRTC ln v4 over v3 divided by nRTH ln v2 over v1. All right, so immediately you can see these NRs are both going to go. They're exactly the same. Um, and so we've got this result right here, which is almost there, but except we've got to do one little thing. We've got to do one cheeky little trick right here. Now I'm going to show that these two ratios right here are equal. Um, I'm going to actually kind of pull away from this expression right here, and I'm actually going to show that these two ratios are in fact equal. Um, and so what did I say was true for an adiabatic process? Well, I derived this a few videos ago, but I did show that TV to the gamma minus one, remember I said gamma is the ratio of the heat capacity constant pressure to the heat capacity constant volume, which for an ideal gas is five thirds. Um, but I'm just going to generalize it, call it gamma minus 1 for now. Um, and this right here is a constant. So how can we apply that to the Carnot cycle? Well, remember this is only true in the adiabatic case. And so so what is the temperature and volume um, for the adiabatic changes? Well, uh, let's start at this point here. This is Tc. Uh, and the volume right here is V2 to the gamma minus 1. So that's this this point right here. Um, and for point 3, well, it's Th, and the volume is therefore V3. And that's also to the power of gamma minus 1. All right, we'll keep that. Uh, what about the other adiabatic change? So that was from 4 to 1. Um, and so obviously the starting point, the starting temperature at stage 4 of the process is Th and the volume is V4 to the gamma minus 1 uh, and that is equal to the conditions at stage 1 of the process which is Tc um, V1 to the gamma minus 1. So I have actually mixed up all of these temperature terms, silly me. Uh, this is Th, this is Tc, this is T. C, this is TH. Sorry, I do apologize about that. I would have probably put a little text thing just to let you know that I went wrong. So, um, so from this equation, what is TH divided by TC? Well, TH divided by TC is simply V3 to the gamma minus 1 divided by V2 to the gamma minus 1. So that's from that equation there. What about from this equation right here? What is TH over TC? TH 
over TC is one and the same as V4 to the gamma minus one divided by V1 to the gamma minus one. So we can now go ahead and equate uh, these two since they're exactly the same. We can say that V3 to the gamma minus one divided by V2 to the gamma minus one is one and the same as V4 to the gamma minus one over V1 to the gamma minus one. So there's a lot of gamma minus ones floating around and you could just simply say that you can get rid of everything that says gamma minus one. V3 divided by V2 is equal to V4 over V1. So we're nearly there. Uh, let's multiply everything by V2 and divide everything by V4. So what have we got? V3 over V4 is equal to V2 over V1. And so we're going to now substitute out what out, out V3 over V4 for V1 over V2 in this expression right here. So let's uh, let's just rewrite out what eta is. So eta is one plus TC ln. Instead of V4 over th V3, I'm now going to write um, V1 over V2 since that is V4 over V3 divided by TH times the log of V2 over V1. And I can now use the power of logarithms right here and then say that this term right here, I can now do a cheeky little thing. I can in fact reverse the fraction. So instead of V1 over V2, I'm gonna make it V2 over V1, but put a little minus one right here. Little bit cheeky that, I know. Um, but what what happens to this minus one? Well, it's a log law, so uh, you si you could simply bring this minus one down here. So this whole thing is now being multiplied by minus one, which means this just becomes a minus. So, and now look what we can do. We can wipe off these log terms. We've shown that they're exactly the same thing. And what do we got? Well, we've got that our Carnot efficiency is equal to one minus. TC divided by TH and look at that that is the Carnot efficiency this is the maximum possible efficiency you can get from any kind of engine and as you can see it is always going to be less than one because you can never have you can never have if you look at this expression right here this can never be zero um, because if it was zero, then TC would have to be infinitely times smaller than TH. That would be infinity. Um, and of course, that would never happen. Um, you can't, you can never get that. Not Certainly not in any real world scenario. You can get pretty damn close, but you can never get the 100% efficiency. And this is assuming that this, is, this engine is operating at the maximum. Um, you know, realistically, you're never even going to get the Carnot efficiency, let alone one. So this just goes, this is another word for the second law of thermodynamics. And as you can see, uh, the Carnot efficiency is always, always less than one. So what happens when we run the Carnot cycle backwards? Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, let's draw out our Carnot cycle uh, once again. So guys should probably be quite familiar with it by now it's this cheeky little cheeky little bad boy right here so there it is we've got our four points with our two uh, isothermal arms and our two adiabatic arms right there and I said that the Carnot cycle that we do use to derive the uh, efficiency for we said it was running this way so we said this is stage one this is stage two three four and so on and it was running in sort of a clockwise manner um, so the gas heated up it was an isothermal expansion to begin with followed by an adiabatic expansion then followed by an isothermal contraction then finally an adiabatic contraction until we got back to the same point and the area under this in, that's trapped in this little curve right here this little sequence of curves is the work done uh, or the work that you managed to get out of the cycle. So, but what happens when we run the Carnot cycle backwards? Well, we've actually kind of made a fridge in a sense. Um, 
But instead of having to, of getting work out, you're actually having to put this work in. So this same work, the same work that's trapped in this curve right here is not work that you get out. It's not heat being converted into work. It's actually work being converted into heat. So I'll, I'll just say this, for a fridge, for a fridge, the work that you put in gets converted into heat. So you actually, what you do is you drive a, uh, a bigger temperature gradient. I mean, if you think about what a fridge does, so you've got your fridge at home, got lots of, you know, crap in the fridge, if it's anything like mine. Um, what, you, what you're doing is you're putting in work into the fridge. Um, and in a sense, you're cooling the fridge down. What you want is for this fridge to be nice and cool. Um, so obviously, when you start, you don't have any sort of temperature gradient between the, the fridge and its surroundings. But put in a bit of work, heat up the surroundings, and then you can actually cool the fridge down. So you're trying to get heat to kind of leave the fridge so that the fridge ends up really, really cool. Uh, and that is how it works, essentially. Um, you know, you might think it's a bit weird to sort of put in work and get like a cooler, a cooler system. But, um, but actually, yeah, this is how fridges work. And, and so what I can do is I can actually draw a diagram uh, just like the one I did before. So here we have our two different temperature baths, our quasi-static approximation temperature baths that us thermal physicists love so much for some weird reason. Uh, this one is at a hot temperature and this one is at a cold temperature. Um, so this is going to be the interior of the fridge and this is going to be the surroundings. And so what we're doing is we're putting in work right here. This work is going in and this forces heat to flow from the cold temperature source to the hot temperature source. And it forces it to flow in that sort of direction. And what's going to happen is that, uh, is that the heat, um, if heat's going this way, then it's going against a sort of natural gradient and so therefore you're going to end up with this being increasingly cool. So this is our work going in. Uh, we're going to get heat extracted from the cold source and we're going to get heat extracted from the hot source. And so this is how a fridge works. Um, now the same rule still applies. You still have that the work that you put in is equal to the difference between the hot source and the cold source. That doesn't change, but what does change is the efficiency. So we said before that the efficiency of an engine is the work that you get out divided by the um, heat that you have to put in. But the efficiency is definitely going to be different for a fridge, isn't it? So how are we going to define the fridge efficiency. Well, we're actually going to introduce this very kind of weird term. It's called the coefficient of performance. And coefficient of performance, what is it? It's it's basically defined. We're going to define this term, this COP term, as the heat leaving the cold source divided by the work that you put in. So essentially, this is the going in term, and this is the what you want term. So that's the best way to think of, of the coefficient of performance. It's a measure of efficiency, but the thing that can really screw with your mind about the coefficient of performance, certainly when I was learning about this, it's normally quite a bit bigger than one. Um, you know, if you sort of think about a typical, um, a typical sort of temperature gradient, you know, TC is going to be what? five degrees, which is 278 Kelvin, uh, and the surroundings are going to be, what, 20 degrees, so like 293 Kelvin. And so and so what you actually end up with is um, a coefficient of performance which is much greater than one, because the work you actually have to put in is normally not nearly as much as the, as the heat that you extract from the cold source. And that can be a little bit weird to get your head around. Um, like certainly when you're doing calculations, you can think it's a bit weird, but when you're doing homework questions, don't be surprised if the coefficient performance is a lot bigger than one. Um, unlike efficiency, which has its maximum value of one, the coefficient performance can actually go above one. So yeah, don't be surprised by that. You can also show that the coefficient of performance 
uh, I should probably note this is for a fridge. We're actually going to come on to one more thing. But this is the coefficient of performance of a fridge. Uh, it can also be shown that the coefficient of performance, well, what is the work? The work is, we're going to rewrite this, but instead of writing work, we're going to write QH minus QC. And it can actually be shown that instead of writing heat, you can actually substitute all these heat terms for temperature terms. Um, this normally isn't derived, so I'm just going to state the result. But you can write, instead of QC over QH minus QC, you can also write TC over TH minus TC right there. And this is also another expression for the coefficient of performance. So if you're given temperatures rather than heat, then uh, that is the expression to use. So I'll just uh, we'll just highlight this bad boy right here, and there we go. This is the coefficient of performance for a refrigerator. So it's the ratio of the cold temperature divided by the difference between the hot temperature and the cold temperature. And like I said, it can be a lot bigger than one. Um, so there's one more thing. Uh, what if we don't run it as a fridge? Now we're still going to run it anti-clockwise. We're going to do exactly the same thing. However, we're just going to think a bit differently about what we want. So rather than having a fridge, which we want to cool down as much as possible, we what if we want to heat something up as much as possible? So say we've got um, say we've got like some sort of tub of water right here. And we really want to heat it up to generate steam in order to generate like a turbine or something. Um, so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to apply some heat, obviously. But if this heat is hotter than its surroundings, then obviously you're going to have to put in some work. So work's going to have to go in uh, to heat up this, this uh, thing here. And we call this a heat pump. That's basically what it is. We're pumping heat up into this system so that we heat it up. Now the goal is, uh, instead of heat of cooling the colder, ba colder bath as much as possible, we want to heat the hotter bath as much as possible. So that's going to change what our coefficient of performance is. So let's define the coefficient of performance for a heat pump. And instead of QC over work, we're actually going to write QH over work. However, we actually have to be a little bit careful and put a modulus sign in. And that modulus sign just shows that it's, uh, being, it's being driven in the opposite direction to what it would be for a, a, heat, uh, for, for a heat engine. Um, so this, this is basically the reason for this modulus sign right here. And similarly with the fridge, you can also express the coefficient of performance as TH divided by TH minus TC. And it just so happens that this is actually one over the Carnot efficiency right here. Um, so one over the Carnot efficiency just happens to be the coefficient of performance for a heat pump. This isn't, of course, this has got TC in the numerator, but this one is, it just so happens that uh, uh, this is one divided by the Carnot efficiency. So there we go. Um, now you know how heat engine, heat pumps and fridges work in case you're ever interested. Let's face it, you probably weren't, but that's okay. Just between you and me. Yeah, we're not going to worry about that. All right, I'll see you guys in the next video.